All right, well, that was the easy question, gentlemen. Now we're going to move on to the tough stuff. And the first one actually deals with the Pentagon Papers, um, but we're, gonna, we're not going to dive deep into the Pentagon Papers. I want to I talk more about the correlation to today, the Fourth Estate, Ellsberg, and Assange. And, and you know, I was doing my research on this because I had no idea what the Pentagon Papers were before you announced, and everybody had to learn about this. I'm a, I'm a four-year progressive, where you've got 40 years, you've got 20 years, right? So I'm very new at this. Um, I saw a quote from Ellsberg that said, um, I want to dispel the idea that um, Ellsberg good, Assange bad. And I'd like you to talk about that, uh, Senator Gravel. Start there, and then I know you've got something to say on that. Go ahead. Well, first off, I would consider uh, Assange even superior to Dan uh, and myself uh, for the very simple reason that he has done something very unique in the publishing industry. Now, he is a publicist, and, uh, you know, regardless of what the government may want to tag him with in order to incarcerate him, he's a publicist. He's put out information uh, from essentially, uh, mostly, or not mostly, but uh, from uh, the, the people who whistleblowers is the word I was looking for. And, and so, in my mind, he should not be incarcerated. If, uh, if Trump is going to give a medal to Tiger Wood uh, for his uh, golf uh, abilities, uh, I would uh, say that it's even more meritorious to, to Assange. And, uh, and not only Assange, but, uh, of course, uh, Chelsea Manning, who's in jail today because uh, she refuses to com uh, comply with a what I feel is a very onerous uh, requirement uh, for from a grand jury that she testify uh, against Julian Assange. Uh, they're they're both whistleblowers, uh, and uh, and they in fact the, the only thing that sustains our democracy from an informational point of view, in my mind, is whistleblowing. The mainstream media does not do the job that's required of a democracy. Uh, there's too much secrecy in government. And so I think that Dan Ellsberg would join with me in saying that Assange should be, uh, should go free and continue publication uh, of his WikiLeaks. That's what, that would be my hope. But obviously you've got the power of the United States, uh, allied with uh, what I think are some very terrible people in Great Britain. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I don't see a positive results other than Julian and Chelsea and others suffering for their contribution to democracy. Absolutely. Well said. Uh, thank you for saying it, too. I appreciate that. Uh, you don't hear that on MSM. Uh, before I bring in this next statement that ties this together with, with, uh, with the next question, Shahid, add what you were talking about in Green Room about this, please. Yeah. If I were to draw a contrast between, say, for instance, uh, Ellsberg and Assange, it might just be, for me, in the identity of Assange as a journalist and Ellsberg, like Chelsea Manning, like Edward Snowden, like others, as whistleblowers. You know, Assange, as a member of the press, I think has an even more unassailable right uh, to to publish, and I think that we have to understand the crackdown on Assange, on Manning, uh, the vilification of Snowden, and for that matter, the dismemberment of Jamal Khashoggi and his mutilation through the lens of international attacks on the press and access to information by the public. This is a a key cornerstone of authoritarianism: is to deny information to the public. And I see it particularly demonstrated when our kleptocrat in chief describes the press of the enemy of the people, knowing full well that the press is a crucial ingredient of, of liberty in any meaningful sense. Uh, and when we see the federal government, and this is an important point to note, not just under Republican presidents, but under Democratic presidents also, vilifying whistleblowers, treating them like spies, prosecuting them as if they were spies instead of conscientious public servants who were doing the right thing and going so far even as to resign their careers 
to alert the public to information that we have a right to know, I think that we should all be very alarmed. And I think particularly the, the, uh, the, the prosecution of Assange, the ancillary, let's say, detention of Manning pursuant to it, you, we can't perceive these as isolated incidents. We have to con consider them in the context of the Trump administration coming into office after a Democratic administration that set a record in our republic for how many whistleblowers it would prosecute the spies, far and away beyond the previous records. And in that context, I think, uh, and in the context of, of our president vilifying the press, uh, their, their prosecution, their, their vilification, their persecution uh, represents a, th uh, a threat to all of us in a free system. Yeah, that's thank you. I appreciate that too. That was well said, uh, uh, Senator Gravel. Do you agree with that? Well, to totally, that? totally. There's no question. Here, uh, if, if I were president, I would give a medal of freedom to uh, Julian Assange, to Snowden, and to Chelsea Manning. Uh, they have done more uh, in the last uh, fifty years uh, towards uh, improving democracy than anybody else that I know. Here, 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 here. And it's, it's, so I'm going to read a quote as I was doing research on the Pentagon Papers. I'm going to read this quote that I found, which kind of blew my mind. Uh, hero of mine, and one of the reasons I started Bernie 2016 TV, I would, what you may not know, Senator Gravel, is this network is run out of my garage, and it was started in 2015 because CNN and others were completely blacking out and censoring Bernie Sanders and running empty Trump podiums, and I said, we've got to do something about that, right? Um, independent media has had to rise up in the place of uh, what mainstream media used to take care of, the fourth estate. Something's changed, and this, in my research, I was like, you got to be kidding me. So I'm just going to read this to everybody. On February 27th, 1968, respected CBS TV newsman, Walter Cronkite, one of my heroes, who had gone to Vietnam after the Tet Offensive, offered an on-air commentary during the regular CBS evening news program watched by millions, concluding that the Vietnam War was mired in stalemate. Just those three words, mired in stalemate. That broadcast is regarded as seminal in raising doubts among mainstream Americans about U.S. involvement in Vietnam. So it seems to me that the problem our government is definitely corrupt and a problem, but what happened to media? What's changed with, with mainstream media? Because watching your, your uh, interviews on, uh, with the Pentagon Papers uh, back in the 70s, uh, Senator Gravel, it seems to me like the media was actually working with you. What's changed? Nothing has changed. Uh, the mainstream media is controlled lock, stock, and barrel by the military industrial complex and Wall Street. Hmm. And, uh, and, and so they don't have to communicate, they just know what the criteria, criteria is for success in the mainstream media. And so I don't uh, anticipate anything correcting that uh, because uh, until you can break the hammer lock that the military industrial complex and Wall Street have on our structures of governance. That's the reason why I advocate and strongly support the creation of a legislature of the people. So I, you know, it is what it is, and we've been suffering this. In fact, when people say this is, you know, this is recent hell, this was put in place by the framers of the Constitution in 1787. Uh, if you look at our Constitution, it was written by elites, for elites, and the perpetuation of elites. Well, who's the, uh, the cadre of elites today? It's the military-industrial complex, which needs unlimited wars to make profits, and uh, Wall Street, which is the banking interest of the world, uh, which asserts uh, their control. So when we talk about uh, the media and communication, I have I have no hope that uh, that it will change. The, it used to be called general. Uh, it used to be called uh, what, uh, uh, yellow journalism. That's what it was. Uh, and of course, when you look at that, you, we see we see that with the mainstream media, and we see it also with Fox, which takes uh, it, which is mainstream, uh, but it 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 it, it exaggerates. Uh, positions that are not in the best interest of the general public, but 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 that's part of the dumbing down 
by the elites of the American people that one, they're not competent enough to self-govern, uh, and, and two, they're not going to get a chance at self-government because of the controls that exist within the structure of representative government, which is totally deficient. Absolutely. And I agree. And I know that Shahid was smiling the whole time you were saying that. So do you have any comments or anything you want to add into that, Shahid? Well, A, it's refreshing to hear someone else say it. B, if I did have a quibble, it, it would be, I, my impression was that in the 70s, the uh, extent of media consolidation had not grown as acute as it has in the years since. And so I appreciate particularly Senator Gravel's emphasis on continuity there. Uh, as I think about these issues, I often think of the failure of our antitrust enforcement regime to protect meaningful competition in the media world. And that's one of the reasons why, as corporate consolidation of media sources has grown more extreme, that we've lost the opportunity, uh, at least through the corporate outlets, for meaningful editorial independence. Uh, but the point about the military industrial complex owning the mainstream media, I could not agree more with that. And I see it uh, demonstrated up and down the line from the, you know, uh, from the uh, incredible presence of retired generals as suddenly the pundits on every, you know, resource extraction war that the military industrial complex goes on to foment abroad to uh, even just the deference. I, where, I, where I see it most glaringly is in the context of the debate about mass incarceration and how little it ever intersects conversations about accountability at the CIA or the criminals at the, at the agency who were uh, reportedly and admittedly, in, in retrospect, complicit in drug trafficking. You know, we have a mass incarceration epidemic that was built on the backs of a drug war contrived by the CIA to fund the agency's rogue foreign policy in Latin America. And the fact that now the debate about mass incarceration has grown mainstream, people across the political spectrum have agreed that our uh, prison industrial complex is unsustainable, yet across mainstream media sources, never once will you ever find any discussion of how that present day crisis relates to the roots in the long running and continuing impunity for human rights violations at, at the criminal intelligence agency. Absolutely. And I, I want to... To, to continue the, in this story of continuity, because two things happened between 1971 and where we are today that I think are very important to note. And I want to know what you both feel about this, because I've heard some, some differing opinions on this. The Fairness Doctrine was in place, all right? Mm -hmm. And the Telecom Act didn't exist. So do you think, I don't know, with Senator Gravel, do you think the Fairness Doctrine should be reinstated? Do you think that would help things, or do you think it would make a difference? Uh, I think it would help. Uh, I wouldn't uh, base everything on that. Uh, when you talk about the uh, the 71, you've got to appreciate that Richard Nixon uh, set up the, the whole issue of war on drugs in order to, to attack the young people who are protesting the war and the black community in the ghettos. Uh, and we've lived with that. My, my view on that issue, which of course Rashid pointed out about the, the industrialization of our prisons, uh, well, what has facilitated that from my perspective has been the war on drugs. And, and it's tragic. It, it has filled up our prisons. It has, it's caused untold pain to people. It's killed un, uh, any number of people. And the answer is real simple is that it's not a, drugs are not a criminal problem. This is a public health problem. And I would hope that we'd have the wisdom to take the model, which is the best in the world today, and that's the Portuguese model. Oh, interesting. Which has decriminalized all drugs. And, uh, and if you have a Coke problem or whatever, uh, you go to a doctor, get a prescription, and they record your interest in uh, use of drugs, and, and you're not interrupted. You can live a normal life if you need a certain amount of drugs per day to sustain yourself. But what happens is that crime is lowered. Uh, all, all aspects of civil society are improved as a result of that kind of mature wisdom. 
and, and of course, the reason why I cite uh, Portugal, which even which even is more aggressive in this than the Netherlands or Switzerland, is that uh, Portugal is a conservative Catholic country, and if they can turn around and set up a proper system to deal with drugs and addictions then it's something that we ought to be ashamed of that we can't even bring it up. And when people hear me talk about uh, Portugal, the, the, boy, it's the first time they've ever heard of that situation. Uh, and, and of course, if you just do a little bit of research, you'll see that, that they have, of all, all the countries dealing with this problem, they are the ones that dealt with it most effectively. Wow, I did not, I didn't even think about the, the religi as religious aspect of it. That's amazing. Because you're right. I mean, if they can manage to do that, why can't we? We're supposedly super religious oh, over here. Oh, well, we, we, we've got more problems than you can say grace over. Yeah, yes, that's true. That's true. Uh, Shahid, anything you want to add to that? Uh, uh, what about the, the uh, Telecom Act? Because you were mentioning this consolidation of networks, and that we're down to like five, right? Right. Five. So, I mean, how does that, how does that affect things? It's all right. Go ahead, Chad. Sorry, that's all right. So, uh, so the fair, uh, uh, the Telecom Act, and uh, you know, how does that affect the? Obviously, it affects our news information. We'll talk about Sinclair, but do you want to talk about that? Yeah, right. I mean, I, I think particularly about like Clear Channel and radio, or you know, Jeff Bezos and Prince, or you know, the the the, the gobbling up of small media enterprises by larger ones, and the extent to which you have editorial decisions being made through there. Uh, corporate headquarters, essentially, constraining the editorial independence of what used to be community voices. We see this also across the landscape in interesting ways that people, I think, did not necessarily anticipate with the passage of the current uh, regulatory and statutory framework. You know, for instance, there, uh, there were, and I think in some cities there are still networks of free weekly newspapers. Here in San Francisco, we lost ours uh, a few years ago when the San Francisco Bay Guardian had to close down. And to some extent, you know, you can locate some of that in the regulatory and the statutory regime. Some of that is also market forces. I mean, one of the, the biggest threats to print journalism to emerge in the last 20 years, uh, for better or worse, unfortunately, was the Internet, right? And, and as the Internet emerged and, and particularly classified advertising revenue fell through the floor, it made it really hard for traditional print journalism outlets to maintain their, their business models. And, and that, I think, is exogenous to regulation or, or, or legislation. It's, it's really a feature, in that case, of the evolving technological uh, uh, landscape and marketplace and how it impacted legacy industries. It, we often, in the, in the context of like uh, emerging industries, will chalk that up to disruption. One of the things about media, though, that we have to remember is it's not just any industry. It's an industry that is also the fourth branch of government. It's an industry with a constitutional dimension, which is to say, as our media landscape has been disrupted by the Internet, there, there is a constitutional wake that uh, that disruption has set off. And it's one that we are continuing I think, to try to get through. If you see it visible in the crisis and confusion of the news, you see it visible in the uh, susceptibility of our civilization to being gaslit by a criminal president you see it in uh, any number of things you know the the uh, co-optation of a policy discourse by partisan interests that obscure often the underlying issues that are ultimately at stake uh, I think all of these things can be attributed not just to corporate consolidation and not just to the telecom act but also unfortunately to the rise of alternative technologies namely some of the very ones that that, that I'm very fond of and that I spend my time trying to protect uh, in, in my work. I think the internet has, has disrupted our media landscape in a way that we have not yet um, figured out as a society how to uh, uh, retain in its important aspects. Interesting statement.